Thank you, Paul. It's, it's good to see Jim looking well. Uh, I know your nurse has been attending to you meticulously the past couple of weeks. And, uh, Marianne has been keeping us up to date with your progress. And we appreciate you going to speak for us this evening, Jim. So isn't the time is yours for as long as as short as you want to speak? Go ahead, sir. Nurse practitioner. Uh, it's the second time today that I was expecting a very sober sort of a gathering. A lot of people at the little assembly that I assemble with um, dying dead and on and on and on so i got there and um, discovered it was anything but uh, the song service right at the beginning of this uh was a, a lift it um it's all about singing and hope and all of that that first one i can't remember the name of but i need to get out but I've heard it before. Marvelous things. I won't go into who I see that I recognize and how fine it is to see you. You know what I feel. It's true. I'm, um, sometimes I think I'm, I think it's humorous. Other times it really hacks me off. When I hear people speak of Christians who lack realism, well, that's 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 the thing about you people, don't you see? You sing all these little romantic songs about God and all the romantic sounding songs about Jesus Christ. And our brother Mervyn uh, spoke about our. Uh, God's love of us and how he loves the world and all of that. How can you people talk like that in a world like this? Uh, that's what is said to us. Huh. The, the story has gotten out somehow or another that Christians don't experience real life, you know. They go to buildings and they get in there and they talk a lot of nonsense and God's love. How can he love us when the world is like this and that and the other? Yeah. But Christians don't need any lectures. I might hurt and loss and pain. They've had plenty of it. They've had plenty, plenty of it from the day that God chose out a, a people, Old Testament church, and Israel got its times. But more particularly for you and me, um, the Lord Jesus came along and called out a group of people, uh, the New Covenant people, and they give him no ultimatums. They didn't say to him, well, we'll follow you if you see to it that we don't get hurt, that our families are all healthy and well, that our marriages work well and they go with this. Look, look, promise us that you will keep everything well for us and we will turn to you. Christians didn't do that. They don't do that. They've lost people. That is lost people who died. They've been bereaved of people that they love more than they love their life. They know what an ill health is. They have all kinds of things come their way. They've been hurt by other people. They've been betrayed by friends. None of this is new to them. So when people speak of Christians, 
I heard it more in the earlier years, but I'm still hearing it nevertheless. What a bunch of idiots Christians are. And what what is it? Do, do, do they really know what is going on in this world? We just heard about from our brother about different this, that, and the other. Hmm. The year I was born, Tojo and a crew, the Imperial Forces of Japan, uh, walked in on Nanking. And within weeks, depending on whose number you believe in, up to 300,000 Chinese were raped, beaten to death, burned to death, beheaded, used as exercises in killing women, um, tied, as not too long ago, happened over when ISIS was on the go, strongly. And the troops just made use of them any time they were good and ready. Through up to 300,000. It said of um, it said of Stalin that he invented. This is true. He invented uh, famine, held back seed, and all of that, so the people in the end ended up starving. And the sum total, we're told, depending again on numbers, but good work at it anyway. Twenty-one million Genghis Khan, eleven million Chinese. Huh. Hitler, the story, you know, nine months, Africa, 900,000 macheted to death, all kinds of things such as that. Well, it's, it's, it's a, a hideous story. How can you people continue? the talk about God loving the world when he allows all of this to go on. That's the story. That's the story. Good Samaritan. Hmm. If the Good Samaritan had seen that happening and could have stopped it, wouldn't have cost him anything if you just if he'd been able just to stop it and didn't well, we have called him a good Samaritan what, what is all that about what am I why am I saying all of that I'm saying I'm saying that Christians need to understand we need to help one another to understand what a scandalous faith it is that we proclaim when we get together in these things praise God we praise God our faith is grounded in God in the Lord Jesus Christ these people see only all of the evil that is going on hmm and they think we don't see it. And they think we don't feel about what is happening. I came across a woman, not personally, in my reading and checking things out in that. South Sudan. A dozen militia raped her 17 times and then moved from her on to her children. So... I go ministering the gospel to such a place. And the thing I tell her is, well, and I tell it gently, but I tell it, uh, you're a sinner and you need to repent of your sins. 
and you need to give your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ that you might have forgiveness and hope for the future. That cannot be wrong. That's the first thing. That's what I tell her, the first thing I tell her. And she is sitting Two things that can't fill me with awe. The starry heavens and the moral law. Evan Markham, the poet, said, But I know something more mysterious and obscure. The long, long patience of the plundered poor. So what will I tell that lady I don't know personally, but I certainly know of her and her situation, and multiply her by hundreds of millions? What do I say to them? What's the first thing I say? You need to help me, and I need to help you. We need to help one another. We need to become enriched by the gospel of God. We need to become aware of how stunning the claim is that God loves the world. Yes? Hmm. Humans, if we're going to be realistic, if we're going to be realistic, We'll talk, not overly, but we'll talk about these things that we were told about there a while ago. And those I mentioned. That's realism. Let me tell you what else is realism. I spoke at a place a long time ago now. Room was big table, people sitting. And the conversation was to be about suffering. So we talked about suffering for a while, and we talked about realism. Down at the bottom of the table was a mother and her daughter and a little child. And that child was absolutely adored, and it was taken care of, and it was loved, and it would be people that would die for it. There's a big hulk of a father of that child who would fight a T-Rex with a plastic spoon to save that child. You want realism? Then realism is all that torment and hurt and pain. Let me tell you what else is realism. The love that humans can experience in and with one another. I saw this on a television interview. A woman was being, I came in about two minutes later, a woman was being interviewed and she looked tired. She wasn't particularly old, but she looked tired and looked older. The interviewer was very gentle with her and she was saying to her, so what is the, the story? She said, it's our son, of course. He's addicted with all of the drugs, booze first, and then the rest of the drugs. And all of that, imprisoned again and again, had to pay for this, that, and the other to get him out. Then they put him into these rehab centers. She kept talking like that. And in the end, summary, she said, and now we're, we can't pay for our home. We're going to lose our home. And the lady said, how can you keep doing this? And she said, when you love, you have no choice. Humans, humans in the middle of an ungodly, villainous world, Humans who love humans are all over the place. 
There are husbands who love wives and wives, husbands, parents and children, brothers and sisters in a family, loyal to one another, stand by one another, weep when the other weeps, rejoice at anything that the other rejoices. Humans can love beyond our sense of things. He, uh, he died in 2015, this fella. He was uh, a surgeon, a big surgeon in America, gentleman, um, mid-60s. He was a uh, seriously big name. He retired from there and went to Harvard and became the head of medicine uh, at Harvard. He um, then retired from there. He was an analyst. He kept an analyst, not a diary and such, but an analyst. And he took up writing and he wrote a number of books. They're not all of equal value, but some of them are just marvelous. He told in one of his books, it was called Mortal Lessons. Mortal Lessons lessons. You're talking about surgery and all. He said a young couple came to him. Why am I telling you all of this? Um, why, why is that? I'm saying that if you're cynical now, if you're hard bitten, if you don't like these, these sweet stories and all of that, and you don't like stories about how wonderful God is and how wonderful people are, then, then it, it, it won't matter. But I'm saying that there are people in the world who are just ordinary little humans, but with the grace of God, they love unimaginably. Sir Richard Seltzer, the man I'm talking about, he tells in Mortal Lessons uh, of a young couple that comes. She has a big cancerous tumor in her cheek. It has to come away or she'll be dead. He tells them, I can remove this. It might save her life, that's for sure. But if she doesn't have it removed, she will die by and by soon. But in order for me to do this, he's telling us in the book what he's telling this young couple, okay? And he says, um, there's a little twig-like nerve that takes care of, that has the power and governs your lips and your mouth and speech and that kind of thing. He said, this surgery would require me going very, very close. And it's a real possibility that I'll have to go through it, cut it away. Well, they said, okay. He went through the surgery and he tells us, I'm telling you that the physician himself, the physician followed every little track with religious fervor. He said, but we had to cut the little twig line. It's so all the controller whole mouth. It's all over now. Weeks later, I don't remember, but some weeks later, he's now telling the story. He said, I come into the the, um, the room, I, ward, whatever. I come into the ward, she's in the band, mouth is badly, badly twisted. He's on the other side of the little bed, and I'm standing this side, he's at the other, and she's in the middle. And she says to me, doctor says about the girl, she says to me, with all of the trouble, is, is it going to be like this permanently? And he tells me, yes. And he explains again what had to be done and all of that. And sad and all the rest of it. And the doctor again to us, telling us, he said, I looked at them and I wondered 
who are these people that I'm dealing with? And then that was her question. He gave the answer. And her young husband, you know how Americans use the word cute. The young husband said, I think it's cute. And he leaned over and twisted his lips so that they matched her twisted lips. And I uh, wanted her to know the kiss still worked because the love was still there. I don't know who the fella is. I don't know how long ago. I don't know if he's still alive, but I'll tell you. If I could find out where he is, I'd like to go speak to him. So the doctor then says to us, he says, I think it's cute. He leans over, twists his mouth, kisses her, and lets her to know nothing has changed here. The kiss works because... The love is still there. And the doctor said, and I dropped my eyes. He says, because you cannot look and gaze too long at a God. He wasn't talking polytheism. He just saw something, saw something that ordinary prose can't express, can't tell it. That can't be the human. He's saying that kind of love is beyond mere humanness. Your story, my story, our story, the story of the biblical witness, the different ways that it's told, the different events, narratives, poems, all of that. The poem read from the Psalms is very read earlier. Yeah. All, all of that tells us that Jesus Christ, the living Lord Jesus Christ, though you don't visibly see hell, is in the world. When we suffered a while ago, he had said earlier to them, I will not eat again of the bread or drink of the wine till I drink it anew with you in the kingdom. And when you eat and when you drank together as oneness, you could have whispered to one another, he's here. And so he is. And he ate and drank with us. And when he said, this is my body, and Paul gives us the word in 1 Corinthians 11, this is my body which is given for you. Christ wasn't giving just bread, and he wasn't giving just wine. The bread remains bread and the wine's wine, but in the giving of the bread and the wine, he's giving himself. So you just met him there a while ago in that sacramental way. You met him. And he goes around the world in and through you, in and through the proclamation of the Gospels, and through a life lived, a life of trust, embodying as God enables you to the degree that he enables you, embodying the gospel. Jesus goes around twisting his mouth and kissing people, diseased people, and letting them know the kiss still works because the love still works. Does he really? Does he really love? Humans, humans can love 
and you know people, you maybe are one of them, but humans can love in this extraordinary way. Doing things, saying things, giving things away, experiencing for on behalf of someone else, ways in which you think, oh no. Women pushing aside policemen, women pushing aside firemen, running into a burning building, people trying to stop her. She will not be stopped, runs into a burning building, doesn't care if she dies. And we got two children in there. And I'm going in. And fathers, even friends, strangers, strangers, putting themselves in harm's way in freezing cold water, helping people get to safety until the point goes where they themselves die. They don't even know who they're doing it for. If humans, if humans can love that well and that deeply and that consistently all over the world, the idea that God does less than that. Does he love less than that? Hmm. You know better. You know. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just wanting you and me to help one another to understand why so many people, they dismiss our faith. They don't know that God is blessing. They don't know that God is giving them happy marriages and, and healthy children and good jobs and all of these other things. God is doing all this, Acts chapter 14, verse 16. God allowed the people to go with the nations to go their own way, yet he left himself not without witness in that he did them good. He gave them sunshine, rain, marvelous harvest, this, that, and the other filling their hearts with gladness. And then in chapter 17, he gives them all this, that, and the other. And why? That they might happily seek after him and find him. For this is a lover. You know where all of our faith in the end rests? Not in how well we speak or not how well we act. Non-Christian people who ignore our faith. Non-Christian people, some of them who are really our enemies. Morally outlive us. Not only do the husbands and wives not have affairs, they don't even think about it. Yeah. They love their children. Grandchildren. They work two jobs or three jobs to get education and kids. Mothers uh, take less uh, money for clothes and that so that their children get on and on and on. Not Christian people do this. And so what in the end is the foundation of our faith? It's one person. Should we not embody him? Yeah, of course. Of course. We image. We image him. God made us that we might image him. Then he comes to us in and as Jesus Christ shows himself, you and me, if you didn't know who he was by appearance, you wouldn't know he was God being a young man. And here he comes and shows himself and says, I want you to image me in Paul in Romans chapter 8. 18 and that, he said, we are children of God. The Spirit declares we are children of God along with our spirit. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God. And if we are heirs of God, then we're co-heirs of Jesus Christ. And we will reign with him 
if we suffer with him in the whole section all the way down to verse 39 is about you suffering it's not true that all your suffering or all Christ's suffering or all of Paul's or Peter's suffering was all persecution it's not true Christ was broken hearted sits on a hill looking down on the city and the text says he's Luke 19 you know the text he's sobbing over a people that don't want him sobbing because he knows what's going to happen he said oh Jerusalem if you'd only known this your hour when God has come to visit you hmm? if you only knew he said and then he hangs leans off the cross and says to his father in the middle of all that bedlam in the middle of all of that jeering, what they're all shouting up at him, he says to the Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What is he, what is he persuading the Father about things that the Father doesn't feel? Never. Is he trying to uh, um, uh, inform the Father that these people don't realize what they're doing? No, the Father knew all about it. My brother Eddie, not too long ago, in a little book he wrote on Ephesians, said, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you die and go to heaven and meet God, you'll meet two Jesuses. Do you know where the strength of your message and mine is? Do you know where the power of God lies? It will draw people. It's in the gospel. He comes to Rome, Paul, I'm going to quit here soon. I know, I know I'm taking too long and going on. He said, I'm coming to Rome. I'm, I'm really going to Spain, but I'm coming to Rome through you. I preached all over Asia. I want to preach in Spain and I'm coming to Rome and I'm coming to the most powerful city in the world and worshiped power and it had power. And he said, I'm coming with a message. I can't be ashamed of what I've got. I'm coming with God's power, not his divine muscle. Not his divine muscle. We know that God has all the muscle he needs. He can will and a universe comes into existence. He just wills it and it happens. And that's coercion. Nature doesn't debate with him. He just says, you know. But to save people, to save people, takes more than muscle. The power that Paul says is in the gospel is the redeeming power of God. And do you know what he says about that? Ephesians 1, 17 and following. Do you know what he says about that? He says, there's a great power. He's speaking to the church, the Ephesian church, and whoever else is a believer. He's speaking to you in the 21st century up in Korean and elsewhere. He said, see the power that's working in you? This is Ephesians 1. Yeah. The power that is working in you, that's the power that accorded with the power that worked in Jesus Christ when God raised him from the dead set him at his own right hand, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but the world to come. And he is the head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. You know who you are? Can you believe who, who you are? These people think we're saying something scandalous, believing something scandalous when we say that God loves people. How scandalous is it when Paul says of the church, you are the fullness 
of him that fills all in all. He's a savior. You fill him full. And Paul was saying, Colossians 1.24, my sufferings, the things that I go through, I fill up in my body for the church's sake, that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Somebody needs to tell you. I need to tell you. Somebody needs to tell you. Somebody needs to tell me. You need to tell me. We need to be telling one another who we are. What glory is in you? But you don't believe that, do you? Well, yeah, you do. You believe it because Jesus says so, because the apostles say so. You know it's true. But we can believe things because it's true and it's right, and we've got it, we've grasped it. But to the point of feeling it, have you any idea how wondrous you are? Huh? Have you any idea what God thinks of you? Glorious sons and daughters of God. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't do a whole lot. You don't know how much. You don't know how much you don't or don't. don't. Do or not. In John 15, he said, I'm the true vine, you're the branches. Whoever dwells in me will produce much fruit. He doesn't say, whoever dwells in me could produce fruit or might produce fruit. He said, if you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Well, yeah, but I don't. I don't see what it is. Well, he didn't say, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will see the fruit that you bear. He doesn't say that. He just says it'll hop up. I think in that text we're talking about conversions, but it's not the only fruit that's born. And in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, you know the text. Jesus said of you in, Matthew, in John 17, 17, 14 and following, he said of you, he said, I give them your word and they received it. And the world hates them. Not every man, woman, boy and girl in the world. There's this throbbing, invisible predator. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. That's who, we don't wrestle against that man or that woman or this, that, the other. We wrestle with the power that has now control over them and has them as captives. That's, we wrestle against those powers and we do it for them. We not only do it for ourselves, we do it for them. Those pieces of armor that Paul mentions, he gets from the book of Isaiah. And it's God who puts them on. And the text says he looks and he sees nobody's helping. So he gets up and puts on the armor and he goes to defend and deliver. So the armor in Ephesians chapter six, it's not just self-defensive, it's for the world. And he calls you to do that. And you see what you're fighting against? The powers. The assurance we've got is that he who is in you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. So one way or another, it ends up right. But in the meantime, in the meantime, he says in John 17, I give them the, your word. They took it. The world doesn't like them because they're not, as what the text says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he says in 17, 14, I'm not asking your father to take them out of the world. Do you know why you're here? Do you know why you're in the world right now? Because he wants you in it. He says, I don't want you to take them out of the world. 
I just want you to keep them from the evil one. And as you have sent me into the world, even so, I send them into the world. Do you believe that you are not of the world, but that you are in the world because that's where he wants you? And in the world, he sustains you. It's an invisible thing that affects the world through visible people, but the power behind it all is a predator, a slimy, big, crawling python feeding on people. Who, who do the non-Christians wrestle with? You, you, Chris, you wrestle with the darkness and the powers of darkness. You have Christ. These people, who are they wrestling? against same things, but now enslaved in the flesh. Paul in Rome, Paul in Romans 8, 8 and following says to the Roman Christians, you are not in flesh. Do you believe that about you? You are not in flesh, he says, but in spirit. You know what Christ did with the flesh, life in the flesh? You know what he did with it? He laid it down, round to the cross with it. When Peter didn't like what he was saying about that, Christ rebukes him and says, what you're saying is satanic. You're holding on to what people want to hold on to. You know all the people who will survive COVID? You know what's going to happen? They'll die. You know all the people that ate Moses' bread back in the day? They're all dead. Do you know what happened to the two big audiences that Jesus fed with bread? They're all dead. Physically. He says, Peter, believe me, I'm nearly done. You're doing very well. God bless you. Peter says in 1 Peter 3.18 that Christ was put to death in flesh. There's no definite article. Christ was put to death in flesh, but was raised in spirit. He's no longer fleshly. He's now glorious. His body now is a glorified one. 1 Corinthians 15.45-50 to 50 says, we have borne from Adam and Eve the image of the earthly, natural man. We will bear the image of the heavenly, the glorious one. And that's what's ahead. That's what's ahead of you. And that's what he offers to them. Nothing less than the... Yeah. 1963. Pick quick. Pickwick, a musical built loosely on Charles Dickens' first book, The Pickwick Papers. Pickwick in it has a, has a friend, Frank, no, Waller, yeah. He, he, he's a shrewdy, and he's always talking people into things, and he talks Pickwick into offering himself as a member of parliament. And he says, well, I don't know anything about politics. He said, here are the answers. And you give him some answers. And in the musical, up oh, gets Pickwick. And the people are asking, what are we going to do about the schools? Close them. What are we going to do about the taxes? Up the taxes, you know, and all of that. All of that. And then they start booing him and all the rest of it. And then he says, well, okay. I know nothing but politics. Nothing. But I know this, I know the kind of world that we would love our children to rise up in, to live in. I know the kind of life 
that I would love them to be able to live and enjoy and rejoice in. I know all of that. That's the kind of world that we dream about. Well, two fellas, Arnadel and another, wrote a song called When I Rule the World. And I'm taking the words of their song. That's the last thing I'll tell you, okay? And then we'll be done. My end of it. Uh, I'm taking the words from the song and applying them to Jesus Christ. You see what John Lennon wrote? Imagine. A lot of nonsense in it. But do you know what he was wanting? No wars. No killing. No having to this, that, and the other. That's our story. His way of talking about it was all nonsense. But what he wanted was what we want. What he wanted is what God has always wanted for us. God doesn't need to punish us, really. We punish ourselves. All the ugliness and brutality in the world is not the work of God. It's ours. Yeah. But what God always meant, he meant for humans. He meant humans not to be mortal. End of story. He made us mortal with the full intention of giving us eternal life with him as his companions. Yeah, forever. So that's what Jesus tells us. That's what he's after. Not life in the flesh. Life beyond the flesh. Goodness and kindness and the grace of God why we're here. But he said to Peter and the rest, you don't get it. The mortality, life in the flesh is not what I offer. I didn't come to give that. See that cross? Pick it up and follow me. And Paul in 6.14 of Galatians says, he sees the cross and he said, I'm not going to glory in anything except the cross. He said, by which the world, this satanic world, is crucified unto me and I under the world. Jesus then says, I'm picking the words of the song when I rule the world. And he says, he's already King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but there's a day coming when it will be publicly made known. And that's the day we're talking about. He said, when I rule the world, every day will be the first day of spring. Yeah. Every day will be the first day of spring. He then says, when I rule the world, he's already ruling it, but in the day when it's all public, when I rule the world, everyone will be as free as a bird. Every voice will be a voice to be heard. Take my word. We will cherish each day that occurs. My world will be a beautiful place where we'll dream such wonderful dreams. My world, it'll have a smile on its face like a man in the moon has when the moon beams. When I rule the world, everyone will say the world is his friend. There'll be happiness that no man can end. No, my friend. Now when I rule the world, when I rule the world, every head will be held up high. There'll be sunshine in everyone's sky when that day dawns and I rule the world. Some of us here before long will be dying. It'll help on. It's okay. But you'll not meet when you go shopping, maybe tomorrow, when you go wherever you're going, you see wherever you see. Not one person that you see will not have the mark lived for, dying for, rising for everyone you know, everyone you meet. I don't care who they are or what they are. He lived for them. He died 
for them. And he groans for them. That's our story. Even the ones who mock and all of that. Yeah. And one day, when it's your close to your turn and mine, and mine's coming up soon, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But we're sitting waiting where? In, in your little lonely office or, 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 or kitchen or wherever, wherever. Hospice care. You come up and he'll sit down beside you and he'll tell you, I have a gift I want to give to you. It is absolutely a wondrous gift. And you will say, oh. And he will say, how does that sign to you? And you will say, well, if you say it's a wondrous gift, I'm, I'm wanting it. And he says, well, I'm eager to give it to you. But you'll have to come with me and leave your friends for a while. And you will say, oh, I, I, I can't do that. I would, I would miss them terribly. And you would say, and he would say, no, you won't miss them. I want to take you to a place where you won't miss them. Yeah, but they would miss me and they would cry about it and, and they would go on and on and they would really miss me and God would say, I know, I know, I see it happening all the time. I see it happening. And it's beautiful that people love one another like that. But it doesn't last long. They too will one day join you in a great reunion. So don't worry about that. And you say, well, is there any chance I could take this body with me? And he would say, no, you can't take that one with you. Now, that was a good body. That worked well for you and served you well. But where I'm taking you, there's so much glory and joy and everything. This model that you presently have is not big enough. No. Glorious enough. I'm taking you and I'm going to give you a glorious body. Oh, and you might say, what's it like? And he'll say, well, it's a secret right now. But you know about it later, but let me tell you, my son has one of them, a glorious body. And when you go and you meet him, he will, because your citizenship is in heaven, and he will take this body of oh, humiliation and he will transform it into the likeness of his own glorious body. Yeah, is that your story? Isn't that your gospel? Now that you believe, and don't you have a right to believe it? Everything, everything hinges on God as he's shown himself in Jesus Christ. Ah. And that's what we offer people. And that's the kind of world we're looking forward to. And uh, I want to meet you there. I want to meet you there. I know we can tell us all the story. And we'll learn about all the dangers and all of that of God was taking care of us when we didn't even know that there were dangers around and happening. We're going there. It's what we're doing. Isn't it? Holy Father, uh, well, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to say, Father. I just know that there are people in Corrine You've met, and they have met you. They committed themselves to you, and all over Northern Ireland, scattered here and there, all over England and Scotland. People who served their course and then went away, having done a good job, a life well lived. And now we have people here in this little group. 
for love you have been loved by you into loving you and ministering for you enrich them enrich them and give them what it is that they need to deal with the needs that they have with each day that comes thank you for saving us not just from particular evils that we have committed but from a world that he according to your will redeemed us from thank you for taking us out of a, the authority of darkness and transferring us into the kingdom of the son that you love all of that we thank you for and here and now we recommit ourselves to you in covenant we want to serve you and serve you well and you will help us and we're looking forward to the day when we'll gather together and be your companions forever in mystery in joy and adventure ah wondrous thought thank you for the christ who had made it concrete for us in his name we pray amen thank you thank you jim we appreciate that uh, uh if you want to contact Shiva, if you do want a, a copy of the a lesson this evening, Sheba will send that to you. And I think alternatively, Frank sometimes posts these on, on YouTube. So if, if you do want to catch up on that, uh, if you contact Sheba and keep an eye on, on YouTube. Uh, just let me remind you, after our closing hymn this evening, you're all welcome to stay around uh, for, for a bit of chat here. Uh, and I would just say, Sheba's got some family business to take care of. So she may put up a, a little flag that she's... Uh, going to have to leave in five minutes, so if you like, look out for the wee flag here. Uh, Robin's going to lead us in our closing prayer, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of opportunity to fellowship and to remember your son, Father. We thank the Father he bought his church with his own blood, opening the way to, sal sal to salvation and for forgiveness of sins, Father. Again, Father, please, with those who have lost loved ones, ask Father to bring comfort to them in their lives at this difficult time in life, Father. Mm. For the sick, be with them, Father, and their families and their friends. We're thankful, Father, that Hugh's operation was successful, Father. Pray to continue to bless Sam after his surgery as well. Also, Father, we'd like to add uh, Joseph to the list as well, Father, that, that he has to get through, Father, to bless those who are working with him and have his life, Father, too. We thank you, Father, for all our blessings to help us throughout life, Father, for all our daily things you give us, our food, our homes, our work, and for our many good things in life. We're so thankful. As we close, Father, I ask you to with each of us, Father, as we go through a new week, Father, whatever challenges we meet, we'll meet them through them with you and your Son. So in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I need to say good night, okay? Okay. Thank you. God bless you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>